Okay, right. We'll go, darling. Uh, uh, no, not really, actually. Uh, so it makes it easy to buy presents when you know. That's what I keep telling him. Anyway, uh, fold the D. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm talking about continual professional development after your coaching courses, and John is talking about similar sort of thing, but inventions. Uh, um, on your individual sports range, uh, and these might have a. Do you know of anyone in other? Okay, uh, one of my questions. Right. Okay, we'll start off with how do you think you could develop best as a coach? We'll start off with. In the course itself? Yeah, in the course itself, or what you've learned on the courses, or what you've learned outside the courses, just uh, in general. I think maybe in the course it was too um, skill based, and obviously there was the safeguarding for children, like the necessity stuff, but there wasn't enough touch upon like leadership styles and how to cater to individual needs, like personality types, there wasn't much right, psychological stuff. And where did you go and then learn that? Did you learn that at uni? Um, I'd say I learnt that from like observing my coach okay. in the school. Oh, what, you do kickboxing? Is that boxing. boxing. Yeah. Alright, um, great. Um, you, know my, you know my views on this. I know. Um, the recorder though. Yeah, like I was just thinking there. I think the for, for me the um, the uh, the NGB stuff is more like a scratch card in that you actually have to scratch through it uh, to see whether or not you've actually won anything. And, and most people don't. They just get the card and off they go and they do the sport. So um, I think the the real valuable stuff is when you start scratching the leaf. And the problem I have with, with some of the NGB stuff is that they, it's not that they. And I, I understand there's constraints, so you might have a weekend or two weekends, maybe you level one or two, whatever it's going to be. Uh, you've got however many people on it. So it's a great introduction to the areas, but what they what they fail to do then is to provide the opportunity for people to scratch into the scratch card. And if you're interested in, oh wow, the leadership stuff's really interesting. Well, okay, here's a whole library of information. Boom. Or here's some skill stuff, here's skill act stuff, or here's some technical stuff, etc. So the thing for me with the NGBs is they don't provide the depth of information for people to actually then go and improve truly as a coach on any level, on, on, on any amount of depth. And, and that's across all the sports that you've done it in. Correct. So, okay. Um, so just quickly, uh, boxing. Yeah. Uh, what coaching qualifications do you have? Or do you have? Level one. Level one. Yeah. And level three rugby. Level three and rugby. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are both of you looking to progress? Are you looking to go to your level four? You can only do level four if you're a professional like, uh, coach, coach and premiership. Okay, that's interesting. How about you? Are you looking to...? Not really, because sometimes the incentive of the boxing coaching qualification is to get the, um, the, the badge and certificate um, to be able to be in someone's corner for a fight. And to do that, you're kind of dropping your reins of being a boxer. You're not really meant to do both. You're not meant to be in the corner. And you're more of a performer then, at the yeah. coach? Okay, yeah. Cool. So, um, what you said there, Griff, about how there's a prevention for you doing the level four because you have to be a premiership team. Well, you have to be a professional oh, coach, yeah. Yeah. essentially a premiership team. There are a number of exceptions, exceptions. Uh, but again, it's a, you still have to be a professional coach. Yeah, that's, that's, the, the reason why is because um, I'm doing my uh, essay on, on the LTA, which is the Tennis National Government Body. And after you've done your level two, to go on to level three, you actually have to be of a certain standard, which is judged in tennis, I don't know if you're aware, by um, ratings, which take, uh, take quite a while to get down and improve by playing loads of matches and getting a certain ratio of like, win to loss. Um, so is there any of that in your NGB? So has there been at all where there's been, not the prevention of coaching and uh, standard of experience, but uh, standard, is it like? Do you have to be a certain standard of play? Yeah, you, well, it's, not, it's not so much about being a certain standard of player, you have to be a certain standard of coach. Yeah. And that's reflected in whether you're coaching in a certain county team or regional team or something like that. So I, that I understand what I get, but I do think there, are, there needs to be a greater opportunity for those coaches who simply wish to drive forward and be better. And for me, the constraints in place is that they stop the aspiring. So the coach, 
I think myself, who you know, I'm doing a lot of level four stuff at the moment. Um, that's just through some personal work with a mentor within the RFU, and, and, I, and I've, I've driven that myself. But the point I keep making them there is, why don't you just give these people an opportunity? Like, I'm not going to coach a Premiership team. I have no desire to coach a Premiership team. But I want to be the best coach I can possibly be because I'm coaching at a very high level and I'm coaching you and I'm an equally it's a personal issue as well. And that, that that's a that's a problem I really have with the NGOs. So what you're you're saying is that what I agree with you is that to be a, a good coach doesn't necessarily mean you're coaching high standard, to be a good coach is actually to teach someone how to do something in the quickest way possible. So if you're good at doing that, that makes you the highest standard, doesn't it? Instead of necessarily yeah. just being that you're you're coaching high standard. So so do you think it's fair then that um, uh, people who've done their level twos and tens and want to do their level threes uh, um, withheld information, withheld to go on their courses just because they as themselves as a player aren't good enough. Nothing to do with their coaching experience. It's if you're not this good as a player, you're not allowed to come on the course. Do you think that's fair? No, I think that's absolute bullshit. Um, <laughs> And what, 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 what you're doing is you're putting you're putting a massive constraint on future development of, of, of your your international elite top end of the, of the triangle and stuff. We should be having our best coaches coaching the youngest players. Um, you want good coaches coaching higher or, or good coaches or above coaching higher up. But um, the yeah, like like I've already said, I have no issue with, with an NGB wanting to take their professional coaches and model them and doing certain things that that they need to do that's relevant at that level. But a, from a rugby perspective, there's a whole host of stuff around leadership, uh, the whole leadership side of things. Um, not even the technical, technical, it's more around the leadership and that that, that whole rabbit hole area, uh, communication styles, all that type of thing that should be fed into level ones and level twos. Um, when you tend to find the profile of a lot of these people are, you know, dedicated volunteers who give up a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, but a lot of these people come from, you know, they're they own a company or they're a director of the company or they're a manager. Right? They're all intelligent individuals. They all want to be better. Uh, they probably have skill sets, but they're they, they're perceived to be domain specific. So let's take them out of that domain and actually see what people actually have. Make the Richmond under 12s, 13s, and 14s much better. And um, well, guess what? None of those people want to take over the Harlequins job. Um, so I don't see an issue with having essentially two tracks or an adjunct to if you're a professional coach. But yeah, it annoys the absolute hell out of me that, that I can do it before. So. Exactly, yeah, so that will finish so, Can I ask one more question? Go ahead. Sorry, I should have asked this question as all before. Um, so, it's clear what your view is on it. Um, but I don't try to do that. Do you think, so I've got a question down here saying, do you think you have to be a good player to be, I mean, a good player to be a good coach? Because you've obviously said, no, you don't. But do you, is there any time at all where you think that comes into play, where you think, right, this, this standard of players, you, you need to be this, you need to be this standard as a player to coach them? Or do you think it's just completely irrelevant? No, completely irrelevant. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a that, that's an anachronism. The more we hold on to that, the more it gets reinforced. Uh, there are, there are, right from uh, John Wooden, uh, everybody should know, right up to current day uh, coaches on, on a whole host of fields that have, that have played to a decent standard, but not elite, but we consider elite, that are massively effective coaches. We know that coaching is a science. So if you don't have a scientific underpinning to be a good coach, you cannot be a good coach by definition. Um, and what you find is previously, good coaches were people who stumbled upon a lot of these principles, uh, reflected on them and made themselves better. And rugby were just good good people, bottom line. Um, sport has changed since the 50s and, and even before and obviously, so there are more subtleties required to that. But ultimately it's a science, it's an art. And I don't believe that at all, it's a science. Um, and um, everything, every underpinning uh, column that underpins you as a coach can be learned. 
better coaches will pick it up and put it across better than, than, than other coaches. That's what we want. That's the same with athletes. We can put all the athletes on, on, on individualized programs, but some of them will, will react just better. And that's why some athletes play internationals, some only play premiership clubs. So, um, no, we don't really what about you? Yeah, no, I completely agree because I've come across coaches that um, they don't have a lot of like achievements to necessarily like, brag about themselves, but they're an amazing coach. Like, but like, they ha they haven't done great as an athlete, but they're an amazing coach because they've got the understanding to kind of like bring that out of an athlete. Okay, yeah. So I think it's what you pick up on the way as an athlete, not necessarily what you're achieving. Yeah. Um, to both of you, it doesn't matter which, after you've done your course uh, and you've come to the end of it, so Griffiths will be from rugby and weightlifting as well, do you feel that there's been support from your national governing body? If you want to go and find something or support with something in particular, have you got those resources to be able to go and find that out? No. An example would be like the FA, they've got a website you can go on to for coaching resources. Oh, right, okay, yeah, everybody has that. And, and, and yeah, at that level, that stuff is is not good enough. Okay. Uh, the quality of that isn't good enough. So like I said at the very start, the big thing for me is that the network opportunity. So the opportunity to go and spend time with professional teams, professional coaches, seeing them in context, so you can actually see the context, you see the complex system that that is coaching with the athlete, and then you can start to pull that apart based on um, your lack of or or lack of knowledge or particular questions you have in place. But that, a lot, of, the vast majority of that is just driven by the individual. Um, it just seems to be facilitated indirectly by by going on those sort of courses. I think the um, it's a work the conversation I've had actually with the RFU is that in my mind we need a mentorship system in place, um, and, and I do a lot of mentorship. Um, and the value that gives both parties is untold. And, and I'm going to assume that they have a mentorship program at a level four. I'm shocked if they don't. But below that, I think we need to be driving that certainly on a county basis uh, for, for, for those that are interested in and help drive them forward. So that's within rugby, but in weightlifting? No, that's within all. all oh, rugby, okay. Yeah. I, again, the NGVs that I, I've been involved in, they. They all have standard resources on the websites and stuff, but if you really want to take these to the next level, it has to be driven directly by yourself through whatever networking opportunities you manage to, to, to establish. Do you think after the level two on the way you think there is still more to be learned that they can teach you? Well, of course there is. You only have to look at what the... Um, uh, so the EIS and uh, GB Sport have, or is it EIS and UK Sport have, they have that elite meant that top 12 coaches that get invited to the coaching course every year. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an elite of the elite. Uh, so they're picked up and they're given this intensive coaching to make them the elite of the elite. So there's always layers, there's, there's always stuff. But the thing for me is just. You, you're, you can only learn what you need to learn when you're ready to learn it. And quite often, you, I've got stuff I was given five, six, seven years ago that I've gone back and revisited. Oh my God, that's amazing. Oh God, I've had this for seven years. But it didn't mean anything to me back then yeah. because the context wasn't right for me. And that's why I think that's why I think continuing professional development is important. That's why I think mentorship is important and getting the opportunity to go and experience different context is important, so you establish all the other questions. Okay. Okay. how do you think, <laughs> or do you know, so after your level one, do you, feel, do you feel like you could learn things and that you could go, you wanted to go and learn more, or did it sort of, I don't know, stunt your coaching, if that makes sense? So if you weren't a performer, did it, I don't know, inspire you to go and do loads more coaching and do your next, next I like what I've learned from it, I could have learned from my own coach, if I've just gone. To him. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things where in boxing, I don't even really think many of the coaches there then really want to carry on with more of the courses to improve themselves because where they've boxed for so long, and it's, it's an old school driven sport, like a lot of them never had qualifications to be in that gym and it wasn't really frowned upon. Like, like now, if you go to like like tennis practice and there's a coach there that hasn't gotten a course, you'd kind of be questioning like where Why they, they got their accreditation, whereas 
for me, I was working with my coach um, for a year and then he, he was like, well, I want to get you out there and like in the ring sort of thing. And I said to him, well, you need to get your, you need to go and do the whole course okay. so that you can actually take me out there because I don't want anyone else to do so. So it was only because of me that he actually went and did that. Otherwise he was happy just being in the gym, coaching everyone and not having that further involvement oh, okay. because he'd been fighting for so long it was just really much of an issue for him. So, okay. Yeah, I feel like uh, boxers feel like they learn through experience as opposed to being taught combinations and stuff because everyone has different styles yeah. that you're forever learning but probably better from experience. Yeah, so, yeah. I, yeah that, okay, that's really interesting. That is perfectly on time. So. That is all my questions. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Was it, did, you find, did you get anything from the session? Yeah. Did it make you think about things you hadn't thought about before? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Ruth? I'm always thinking about those. I know, I know. It's <laughs> not a question. It's <laughs> worth it. That's right. I'm going to tip my tongue. Oh, man. Okay. I appreciate you asking me a question. Oh, you can stop now. What do you think of the What module is this? Coach education. Yeah, we have to write. So the essay that we've just done, we handed in, was just a review of formal coach education. So the coach education courses that you go on. And then this essay is aimed at picking out a specific national governing body and looking at an area within it. So I'm looking at British weightlifting. They only do level one and two, and then that's it. Whereas in the football, you've got like an enormous tree, loads of different pathways that you can go through. And is that the best way necessary to develop coaches? So that's where I'm going. So we'll see. I think I'm right. I think I'm right. I don't think it's a very good way of doing it. <laughs> we'll see. Right, so what we have to do is John. John. It's a tight. Good cake. I'll just say, yeah, it's been ages yesterday, mate. Well, not ages, but I made them yesterday. I was quite pleased with them. Oh, yeah.